Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, a podcast show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professionals specializing in pediatric dentistry. Thank you for tuning into Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to you and your practice. Brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. I'm your host, Joel Berg. And thank you to our Pedo Teeth Talk sponsor, Hugh Freedy, for helping us bring you great content. We couldn't do this without them. Visit them at www.hughfreedy.com. That's H-U-F-R-I-E-D-Y.com. We're here today with Dr. Brian Goodacre. Dr. Goodacre received his DDS degree from Loma Linda University School of Dentistry in 2013. He completed a four and a half year combined program in prosthodontics and implant dentistry at Loma Linda University as well in 2017, earning a Master of Science in Dentistry degree. He is a board certified prosthodontist. He is the director of clinical technologies for Nobel BioCare North America. He is an adjunct professor at Loma Linda University School of Dentistry, remains and maintains as a private practitioner located in Upland, California, where he practices with his father and classmate. Brian, thanks for being with us today in Pedo Teeth Talk. Well, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a true pleasure and honor. So, Brian, I, I learned that you're one of the featured speakers at our annual session. So this is in part a plug for everybody to go hear the long version. This is kind of a teaser. But you're introducing a subject that is really well established outside of pediatric dentistry and the broader dentistry profession and certainly in prosthodontics. And this is coming into pediatric dentistry. And I'm, I'm really excited because I love the fact that we can bring disruptive things into our specialty as well. And my experience in the profession is that most good things come from the outside into where we are. So this is a perfect example. So today we're going to, the main part today is going to be on the subset of 3D printing. And we're going to learn a little bit about that. A lot more if you go to his lecture for three hours on Friday of the annual session, May 27th, that's in the morning in San Diego. So let's start out by you telling us about this, the broader spectrum of digital workflow. That's the phrase we hear all the time. What is digital workflow? Sure. It's honestly any way in which you can use digital technology. So a computer, a camera, those are very basic initial key tools for digital workflows. But then we move into intraoral scanning. We move into CAD CAM milling and 3D printing. And so really that's going to be that focus of the lecture. We'll be focusing on those three components of intraoral scanning, CAD CAM milling, and 3D printing, and figuring out ways in which you can utilize that in your practice. And for me, the world of pediatric dentistry is just kind of this awesome area that really we have so many opportunities that I think learning more about it and kind of discussing it further will just open up further opportunities than I can even imagine. So I'm excited about it. Yeah, I'm really excited too. I've been tangentially connected, not as a practitioner, I'm a pediatric dentist, but I've been hanging out with your crowd for a long time. (laughs) So I kind of been following this trend in the prosthodontic general dentistry area. It's a big part of what you do. But I'm really excited to see that now with some new products and technologies, this is coming into pediatric dentistry. So let's quickly talk about the first two of your triumvirate you mentioned there, because we're going to spend most of the time on 3D printing. Uh, let's talk about scanning. So where are we with scanning, you know, technology, and and uh, how might that impact pediatric dentistry, just briefly? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, scanning has just kind of exploded. It's been around for a long time. I mean, when we think about it with CEREC and things like that, it's been around forever, really. Um, But the ability for more people to be able to afford it, to be able to utilize it, and the accuracy you can get has just really been greatly improved over the the past decade. Um, So having the ability to scan anything. So talk about from an infant um, up to adults, you can technically scan. Again, you have some limitations with the size of the scanner and things like that, but I've scanned a three, four month old uh, and up to, you name it, um, adult ages. So it, you have a lot of options there, which is pretty pretty exciting. So when we say scanning, is it fair to say it's synonymous with digital impression? Is that the same thing? Are they one and Correct. the same? Yes, exactly. So we're talking about using kind of a wand device 
that you can surface scan any kind of object um, within reason. Um, and it's just taking multiple three-dimensional images and then based on the overlapping information so you have very unique anatomy of teeth for example and so it's able to stitch these small images into a much larger image kind of like your panoramic phone app on your on your telephone where you take a panoramic image it's just taking multiple small images and based on things that are uniform or, or consistent between one picture and the next it can stitch that together into a very large image that's what we're doing with an intraoral scanner just three-dimensionally inside of a mouth so if we take a child that we're interested in, you know, we, we do a physical impression, maybe it's for study models, for orthodontics, or for just mon managing their growth and development, or for some other specific purpose, you know, we might use alginate, which is, you know, cause gagging and other issues, and certainly some, many kids, uh, the material goes down their throat, uh, et cetera. It takes a little, even if you use fast set, it can be too fast uh, sometimes. <laughs> so, so just picking one part of that right now, you know, which parts of that do you overcome with scanning? And just tell us a little bit about the speed. How fast could you sp scan a kid's <laughs> mouth? I mean... Well, for a study honestly, model impression, for example. Yeah, so honestly, yeah. it's it's really just a matter of once you have, of course, there's a learning curve. So you always have to know anything you do for the first few times is not going to be as as amazing as you see on a, a video that someone shows you. So, um, But honestly, you can scan less than a minute easy. Uh, a kid's mouth would probably be even faster, so depending on the, on the size. Um, so probably 30 seconds to a minute. Um, and the, the beauty of it is you can get that immediate feedback. You can look at it. You can evaluate it. And also, if you get occlusal scans where have how things fit together, you can do even analysis of any type of space between certain areas. You can track changes. So if you scan a patient one time and then you see them later on, let's say a month or two later or a year later, you scan them again, you can even map out changes that occur. And that can be really um, interesting to track, which you know technically you could do with models by looking at them and measuring them, but it's very difficult. So having the ability to scan something, align it, and be able to map out movement uh, is pretty pretty cool. So you could get 3D representations right away. And I think many orthodontists already don't make physical models anymore yeah. for study models. They'll just look at it three-dimensionally. You can use yep. it for patient education, for all kinds of things. So I promised I wasn't going to go more into that, so I'll stop with the scanning <laughs> because it's okay. I get carried away in excitement. But let's let's just go quickly to the next step. Once you scan and you have this image, you might do something with that image besides a diagnostic thing. You might actually make a restoration. You might make a mouth guard or something. And in order to make that thing, there are two yeah. pathways. You could either take a chunk of something and mill it down Yep. Or you could do an additive process, which is 3D printing. Is, is that a fair statement? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. let's let's talk briefly, since we're going to talk about 3D printing the most. Yeah. So that's what I promised yeah. our audience, because they have to go to your lecture to hear the whole thing. <laughs> is, uh, tell us a little bit about where we are with milling and maybe the couple of the common materials that are used, and then we can then jump into the last topic. Sure, yeah. So milling and, and commonly it's called subtractive manufacturing like additive is for printing. And so you start with a big block of something and then you have a machine that mills it all the way, uh, mills it away into whatever shape you're doing. And so, you know, the most commonly thought of application is milling crowns uh, that a lot of people do in their office. So, you know, that's a very common, well-established workflow. Um, and again, you design on the computer, you send it to a mill and it then mills out a crown. Um, you know, dentures is a big area of, of using milling as well. And so we have a lot of applications that we can use this type of technology. So what it used to be, you had to mill was your main, mainly your only option for, for most people. And so now um, that's where printing has really kind of opened up the opportunity in offices because buying a mill, maintaining a mill, is a lot more of an endeavor for a, an office to undertake as opposed to a printer. So um, I think it's the ability to re reasonably priced uh, get a printer and be able to do things has really opened it up compared to, to milling, in, in my opinion. But milling offers a lot of benefits in a lot of areas that we, you know, and again, crowns, dentures, those are things that are big areas of, of milling um, and printing starting to make its, its way into those fields as well, of course. 
Yeah, although I do remember how to make a denture from a long time ago, I doubt I'll ever make one. However, we, we do see patients, uh, all of us in pediatric dentistry, periodically with ectodermal dysplasia. Maybe they yeah. have just a few teeth. They have hypodontia. Yeah. They have conically shaped teeth. And I've worked with prosthodontists yeah. many times. We used to have a pedo pros day, and we would find all those cases that need the expertise. But So is that an example of something you might mill with a, like yeah. a methyl methacrylate? Yeah, so um, you know, one of the examples that we'll talk about in the lecture, um, but that we've worked on is you know with um, amelogenesis imperfecta or different things like that, where you're having to replace parts of a tooth, being able to design and then mill. Um, again, many materials you can use. You can use ceramics. You can use composite blocks, um, and so you're able to make shells. And for example, what we've done is we've milled out composite blocks that we're able to then reline with composite in the mouth and create a more long-term kind of solution for someone as they're growing um, until they get to a, 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 an age in which you could then do a final restoration with ceramics. Um, not to mention, not that you couldn't do it with ceramic. It's just traditionally that tends to be a little cost prohibitive. Um, right, especially so, when they're growing and they're changing and the teeth are shifting and that kind of thing. Exactly. So yeah, that's that makes where sense. milling has a lot of opportunities to be able to intraorally scan, design uh, what you want a tooth to look like, mill it out, and then kind of reline it using composite in the mouth um, is, a, is at least something that could be a very good workflow for those type of situations. We encounter that a lot with the uh, permanent molar, first molars, particularly mm -hmm. with yeah. a molar incisor hypoplasia situation. We will now pause for a word from our sponsor. Hugh Freedy is the global leader in dental instrument manufacturing and infection prevention solutions that keep you performing at your best. For more information on Hugh Freedy products, visit hughfreedy.com slash AAPD crowns. That's hugh-freedy.com slash AAPD crowns. And enter the promo code 2682 if placing an order for pedo crowns. We are back with Dr. Brian Goodacre, who is an expert in digital workflow. And uh, Brian's going to be speaking to us our annual session on Friday morning. He's got a three-hour presentation. I urge you to go to it. It's called Interoral Scanning, Milling, and 3D Printing for Pediatric Dentists. So it's just for us. And so we've covered the first two. And now... What I promised we would focus on today for the last part, and that is 3D printing. So I would guess I would start by asking you, you said it sort of before, but what does it mean and what does it offer perhaps in the near future to a pediatric dentist that scanning, I'm sorry, the milling doesn't. You mentioned pricing, for example, having a unit in our office. Tell us about that, please. What is it? Yeah, so... Yeah, so first, you know, 3D printing or what we call additive manufacturing, but it's what it does is it takes a three dimensional image and you put it into the computer, whatever you've designed, and it kind of slices it into multiple layers. So it's kind of like you um, take a tooth and then you would just cut at incremental layers into multiple layers that the computer will do one at a time and three-dimensionally build this object as opposed to milling it away out of a block of something like we talked about with milling. So what that does is one, it's more efficient, you have less waste, um, but it also lets you use different types of materials because in the dental world currently, most of what we do with printing is going to be printed from a resin type of a material. So it's going to have a liquid, it's going to have some type of a light source, whether that's a laser or a projector. And wherever that laser or projector image hits this resin, it polymerizes the resin. So it's kind of like composite and it'll just kind of slowly build this three dimensional object um, out of this liquid resin that we use. And so with that, it just opens up different materials and it also makes it easier for us to have in our office. You can purchase a printer for a lot less expensive than you could get a mill. Um, and again, the only downside to printing is it's a little messy in terms of after you print the object, you have to clean it and prepare it for, sure. for its use. So that's probably the one negative yeah. part. 
Yeah, and you're not saying we should all run out and get one today, but I think in the near future they may the prices will come down. And it'll be kind of like a razor razor blade that if you yeah. do enough printing, you'll get you, you buy the ink, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. And then you get the device if you use enough ink. And I, yeah. I think isn't it true that like the aligner business that we know about, you know, Invisalign, Smelter Club, most of almost all of those are made by 3D printing, as I understand. Is that right? That's that's correct. Yes. Yeah. So it's a it's really a widely used in orthodontics. It's widely used in most avenues of, of dentistry from surgical planning with printing models, surgical guides to, you know, occlusal guards, custom trays and those things, which I think really is really where I think we can find a great use in the pediatric um, practice, because I think, you know, custom trays can be beneficial, um, sports guards, night guards, um, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, really great applications. And that's where a lot of this purpose of these kind of um, either podcasts or lectures is just really to get your guys' minds to think about how you can use it. Because, I mean, I have like blinders on because I'm always thinking of it within like the pros side, um, not as much from the pediatrics. So I think that's what I'm excited to see. Well, that's why I'm excited because all good innovations come from outside our disciplines always. And I think we're going to see that here. So, for example, we talked before about scanning, you know, and you get somebody's 3D representation of their teeth and you have the occlusion. So from that, could you make a, a, a night guard right away? Yes. So you could yeah, do 3D so. printing. Yeah, if your patient needs that, you already have that from their first visit. You can make, or custom trays. I'm just going to run through a couple lightning round with you. <laughs> yeah. <let's do laughs> so the, the custom trays, I mean, you think, why would we want a custom tray? But, you know, we struggle with maybe there's, the tray doesn't fit and blah, yeah. blah, blah. But if you have that scan at the first visit, and I, I like to see a place where we scan all of our patients, get those images in there. Yeah. And then we want to do an impression. Maybe we do want to do a physical impression because we're, for whatever reason, we could have a better fitting tray made out of PMMA or something ready to go when they come in. Yeah. yeah. And really, for me, the, the exciting part is, you know, Having the ability to print in your office, for example, when it gets to that point, um, which it, it already is, honestly, for, for most people, that it's, it's there. It's just you have to obviously make sure you can utilize it to justify doing it. But, you know, the one barrier for most people when it comes to things like custom trays or mouth guards is the design of whatever that is, right? We don't have time to sit there and design it. I personally am one of those guys that I like to do that, but... You know, in a busy why you're a prosthodontist. <laughs> We're weird. Yeah, it's like kind of very, very nerdy, but uh, it's it's a lot of fun. But if you're in a busy practice, you, you don't have the time to, to do that. And so really what's exciting to see is a lot of the companies are coming up with really interesting ways in which you can you scan a file, you send it to one of their partner labs. They do all the design and then they send the file back to your printer and you print it yourself. So oh, cool. it takes a, it takes away that kind of barrier mm-hmm. of, oh, I don't know how to use the software. I don't have time for the software. Well, hey, someone else can do that for you. They send you the design and you can print you know anything you want. Honestly, it's really just kind of the, the limit. Um, the options are limited, uh, limitless. Sorry. And so uh, really, for example, a night guard, you scan everything. You get it set up, you send it off, <clears throat> they'll go ahead and design it, and then you just have to print it and then clean it and post-process it. So it's kind of a, yeah, a nice that's, workflow. I, I see that happening sooner rather than later. You mentioned mm-hmm. to me in our previous conversation that I think you've been involved with cleft lip, cleft lip and palate patients, and we all know about this nasal alveolar molding technique to, to move the segments together pre-surgery. Yes. So tell us a little bit about how maybe 3D printing could help with that. Yeah. So that was kind of the the first thing that um, was the first application I got involved with. And, you know, as a prosthodontist, I figured the last place I would end up involved with was a pediatric side of dentistry because we tend to be at the opposite end of the age spectrum. Um, And that was something that I got involved with first was working with cleft lip and palate with um, Dr. Chen from, from Loma Linda. And it was really interesting to be able to scan uh, a baby design and we in the first attempt we just printed a model and then use that model conventionally still doing kind of a very conventional processing technique to make the nasal alveolar 
uh, molding device. Um, but the idea is to scan, design that digitally, and then maybe at the end, all you have to do is embed the little wires to help put the pressure on mm-hmm. the on the nose. So that's something that I think is really interesting. And and a, a little teaser for the lecture, like to test that out before we did that, I uh, made a little baby denture for my daughter when she was four months old. And so that was kind uh-huh. of that first, um, we for me at least, trying that out. So my daughter was four months old. And so I internally scanned her mouth and we actually designed the denture and printed that. And I'll show the, the workflow and the fun from that. Oh, that's um, wonderful. In, in the you came into the pediatric dentistry family at a young age for your child. <laughs> that's music to our ears. I, I think I, I'm really excited because I think, I think we're going to see this accelerate rapidly when people start to realize the opportunity and as prices come down for these printers and different inks are developed. So speaking of different inks, you know, we, we're the ones that often recommend uh, sports mouth guards yeah. that are... Yeah that are made from a um, softer, more flexible material. And as I understand that it's not really ready for 3D printing today, or is it? Well, they have materials. The the hardest part is, and this is a challenge you kind of run into, is making sure that the materials that are available are also one FDA approved, obviously, um, and then also can be printed on the specific printer you have. And so if you look online and you search for different materials, there are um, FDA approved mouth guard or soft um, plastic type materials that you can print. The challenge is, are those materials available on every type of printer that you may have? I see. And, um, and so, yes, you you can probably make it work, but technically, you know, for FDA side, it all has to be like the whole workflow has to be validated, not just like one part of it. So I think that's where you have yeah. to make sure that that printer can print that specific material. So I think uh, as we wind up here, I want to talk to you about something that, that we do a lot, which is space maintainers. Mm-hmm. And um, we were experts at those. Uh, some people, I still like to make them myself, but I don't get the chance to do it as much. But it's bending wires and bedding acrylic sometimes. And But let's pick the most challenging one, which is the distal shoe, where we have to okay. place this sort of metal device to, to replicate what would be the distal root of the second primary molar to, not, to prevent the permanent first molar from slipping into the space. We don't lose that millimeter or two or more. Uh, I personally think that 3D printing could give us, if you, when you start combining images, like interface the radiographic image with what the 3D printer, this is what you're doing in PROS. You're taking like cone beams and superimpose, and you're like analyzing and coming up with a perfectly fit implant placement or something. Mm-hmm. I think those principles could be applied to um, space maintenance and get better fitting, immediately fabricated ones. Am I making that up or is that possible? No, I think that's an one of those excellent applications. And, and this is where, as we learn more and work more with pediatric dentistry, I think you're going to find this these a lot of ideas like that. And I think you, that is a great application. And I think it's just a matter of deciding, well, what material do you make it out of? How do you make it so it's easy to fabricate and place in the mouth? But the the ability to do that is there. It's just a matter of it hasn't really been tried yet. So it's just a matter of taking right. the software that's there that can do all of these things and then figuring out how to make that work. But with intraoral scanning of the teeth, with this, the designing and then printing, all of that would be very, very feasible. So are you printing any materials today that are embedded into the bone currently that are, you know, yeah, that, so- that are used for that purpose? So I've, I've done some research in the past um, on some 3D printed like kind of scaffolds that you would use for bone uh, grafting. Um, again, all very experimental. And so I think that was there. There are things like that. And there are companies that make custom made blocks and things that are are meant to be placed. We also have custom made titanium fixtures that are used to replace someone who's missing their entire man- mandible. Um, and many other applications, joints and things like that. So there's a lot of applications for printing metals and biomaterials. Um, and so I think it's a very promising future um, for the printing mm-hmm. side. It's just, again, research and a lot more information needed before that becomes mainstream. But I think it's very, very promising. Well, I'm excited to work with you and not just hear your lecture coming up on uh, the 27th of May at the annual session in San Diego. Uh, Dr. Goodacre is going to give us a three-hour lesson on digital workflow, and you get to hear about all aspects as talked about today in much more detail. And, and I hope that I, I believe that our audience will be inspired to think about, hmm, what can I do for 
bringing future technology like this into my office. We can be the testers for you as you advance your own work on 3D printing and digital workflow. So I'm excited. So Brian, thanks so much for being with us on Pedo Teeth Talk. Well, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. And I look forward to seeing everybody in, in uh, San Diego. So look All right, in it. your home state. So we look forward to it as well. And thanks to our audience for being with us today. You're a great audience. We love to hear from you. And we'll see you here next time. Do you need additional CE hours, but don't have time to travel to courses? Did you attend annual session and want to listen to the audio recordings? Check out AAPD's new Education Passport. The redesigned and improved Education Passport is AAPD's online learning center, where you can earn CE and listen to audio recordings from all of our continuing education courses and more. Visit educationpassport.aapd.org for more information. For 10% off any product, use discount code TEETHTALK in the Education Passport store. Pedo Teeth Talk is brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry. If you have any questions or comments, please email info at aapd.org. We welcome your ideas for future shows and guests. For more information on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, visit aapd.org.